education. The News Hour has long been committed to covering that topic. And starting tonight, we'll be expanding our coverage on Tuesdays with a new feature series called Making the Grade. We'll provide in-depth reporting on education issues at every level, from early childhood and preschool all the way through high school and beyond with the world of higher education. We'll explore the most fundamental concerns in schools, communities, and workplaces. And we'll also cover plenty of approaches you may not have heard about yet. Tonight, we focus on vocational education. There's a growing recognition of its value for some students, but how do you determine when it's working for the long haul? Special correspondent John Talenko of Education Week has our story. This year, some three million students will graduate from high school, and most will go on to college. It ought to be something to celebrate, but in fact, nearly 40% of those who go to four-year colleges and some 70% of students at community colleges will never earn their degree. It's the shame of our nation when you look at a student comes out of high school not knowing what they want to do, goes to college, drops out. Now they're in debt, without a job, and not knowing what they want to do. They're worse off than they were you know, as little as a year before. And that's all preventable, all of it. One solution, Principal Dave Wheeler says, lies in schools like his, Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical High School south of Boston. Here, in addition to the regular school subjects, students learn skilled trades and professions. And if they choose, instead of college, they can go directly into the workforce. You can become anything you want here if you take advantage of what we have. Choosing a career program starts in ninth grade. Students spend the first semester sampling each of the roughly 20 professions taught here. Dejan Lopes chose culinary arts. We learned to cook everything. A whole bunch of foreign dishes, American dishes, anything. You name it, we got it. This right here is an Asian scallop saute. Is this a new dish for you? Yes. It's my yeah. first time. The first time, yeah? Yes. yeah? It's not like you're opening a book and reading about it. Culinary arts teacher Paula Kafori. It's hands-on which is so different. That's very nice. Thank you. They come in here every day and open a restaurant, and we do all of the functions for the school. This car has gave us a lot of problems. In collision repair, the work is also real. A customer brings in the car, we like do an estimate on it. This is someone's car? Yeah, and then after we call the customer, we we'll tell them how much it would cost, we start repairing it. Almost all of our shops do some form of we call it live work. Break down the hair a little bit more. Cosmetology takes clients. Construction, we've done complete renovations of buildings. We've done websites for people. We do printing. There's no better way to engage a student than they're doing real meaningful work. Of course, they also do academics. Every other week, students are in traditional classes full time. And this angle is not much bigger than this one, right? These Every single kid is going to learn algebra. Everyone's going to get a high-level literature class. Everyone's going to get physics. On the state math test, 73% of students scored above proficient. In English, 90%, numbers that nearly match state averages. And Southeastern's 93% graduation rate is better than average. On the flip side, SAT scores and scores on advanced placement tests lag significantly behind the state as a whole. But for Dave Wheeler, those are not the numbers that matter most. When we do follow-up studies, um, generally speaking, we hit the 90, high 90% range of students that are either in the workforce, continue to be enrolled in college, or have, you know, gone into the military. But the point is to get you to be a happy, productive citizen. This approach is getting lots of attention from reformers these days, who see it as a way to improve engagement and achievement in high schools. But career and technical education, or CTE as it's sometimes called, has its critics. Even though that is what people are touting as a possibility, rigorous uh, CTE programs, in reality, I don't think it's going to happen. During her 15 years as an award-winning high school principal in New York State, Carol Burris had an insider's view on these programs. I think a lot of schools will take kids that are behavior issues, and we'll say, you know what, I, I think technical education is where you need to be. 
I think they will take kids who have learning disabilities and rather than work with them in academics, push them on that track. We just know that historically. Almost from the start, high schools were organized into tracks with separate programs for students bound for college and those bound for work. And oftentimes, the way the system made that decision was based on the color of their skin or by their zip code. You can imagine that it was mostly kids of color and low-income kids who were shuffled into vocational programs, many of which were terrible. But Mike Petrilli, who heads the Thomas Fordham Institute, an education think tank, says a major shift was coming. There was a big effort to detrack the high schools and the middle schools starting in the late 1980s, early 90s, which was very successful in most big cities. We decided that we were going to give academic education, which essentially teaches abstraction. We decided to give that to everybody through high school. The mission of public schools changed, says economist Tony Carnevale, and college became the goal. The basic American model is high school to Harvard. The difficulty with that is it doesn't work for most students. You ask the teacher, why am I taking this course? And they'll say, well, you need it for college, and that's enough. Uh, for a lot of kids, that's not, not enough. Many arrive at college unprepared, fall behind, and drop out. It would be much better for those people to go into the workforce, get some real skills, and maybe down the road, they would be ready then to go and get a post-secondary credential. Schoolwork wasn't, I wasn't the greatest at it. I feel like I'm more of a hands-on person. For Justin Meeks, fabricating metal was a better fit. He learned the trade at Southeastern, and through an apprenticeship arranged by the school, landed a full-time job just days after graduation. School prepared me well for this. I, I weld here a lot. I have to cut well on here and very accurate. You can't make a mistake no, on a piece mistake. of beam like this. Yeah, you can't fix it. If you don't mind my asking, how much do you make? Uh, 1466. And if I can keep getting more money and more money and raise and working harder, I, I think I could be fine without college. Is this a success? First of all, let, let's look at the alternative. If this was a young person who was not doing well at school, if he hadn't been engaged in something that, that really motivated him, he probably would have dropped out, or maybe he would have made it to graduation and then that was it. Uh, and then he'd be going into the workforce and lucky to get a minimum wage job. This is a much better outcome. And Petrilli says vocational schools like Justin's are different these days. Because at places like Southeastern, tracking is a thing of the past. It's very important that, that the pathways are chosen by the kids themselves. We want to provide options and let the young people make decisions. I think it's very dangerous. I've seen so many kids who have been academic late bloomers, who all of a sudden they mature and they buckle down and they do their studies and they go on to college. When you start to push kids um, when they're too young to make that decision, they're just not ready to make it. But that's not stopping families from enrolling their teenagers at Southeastern. This year, some 800 students applied for 400 spots. In southeastern Massachusetts, I'm John Tulenko of Education Week, reporting for the PBS NewsHour.